Sunday school, we need to remember um, these families that lost their loved ones this past week. There, for us, it might be over, but it's not over for them. They're still dealing with the loss of uh, Sarah and also with Miss Katie. They're still uh, living with that loss right now. And we still need to remember our country and our military, wherever they are serving, they're all over. And we had that uh, yesterday. I hope some of you watched the uh, uh, programs that were on about 9-11. Yeah, um, I, we watched that too. And it was a horrendous thing, but the country came through it and we can come through whatever we can make it through. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Lord, I thank you we can come today. And we are still in a free country where we can meet, where we can enjoy Bible studies and not have to be worried about someone coming in and arresting us or taking our lives or imprisoning us. And I thank you, Lord, that we still have that privilege. And I ask you, Lord, to help us be one that would just embrace this, this freedom that you've given to us. Be with those, Lord, that lost loved ones this past week. Comfort them this week as only you can. Be with our military wherever they're serving, Lord and especially Frank, wherever he is with his men. And I ask you, Lord, now to help us this day that we will take away something from this lesson that will stay with us and that will help us as we continue our journey with you. We'll be careful to thank you, Lord, because we ask it in your name. Amen. And we are at the end of the battles. We have gone through them. I have to say, I had it, a sheet printed out for you where it had the battle and the scripture that it came from. And when I went, I turned off the computer before I printed it, which evidently was a huge mistake, because when I went back to turn it on, it's playing dead. I know many times I punch that little weird button on it. It's not coming on. And I'm going to try to get somebody here, like maybe Hope, to uh, take the battery out and see if we can replace it. Because I'm thinking, I don't, I don't have just that on it. I've got all the tax information on this computer, and I can't lose all of that. I worked a long, hard time to get all that there, <laughs> and I need to have it. So I brought me a thumb drive and all of this stuff, and hopefully we can get everything off of it, or she can make it come to life. I don't know. But anyway, we are at the end of the battles, and after the battles are all over, we get to heaven, we get to the inheritance, and what we're going to have. Now, we followed these people, and the inheritance is right now, too. It's not just in the future. It's here, too, that you have inheritance. Um, we have followed them from Egypt, in essence, from the time they were saved till the time they get in to the promised land. And we have fought ourselves, you all have fought these battles that they fought, the different ones, the pride, position, the ego, the fear, the unbelief, all of these battles that they fought, we fight also. We're just in a different setting than what they were. So with that, they crossed Jordan. One day we'll cross. How many of you heard songs when I won't have to cross Jordan alone? Remember that old song? <laughs> really? It, it's a very good song. Very good. Yeah. You know, different ones that we use because Jordan was a picture of death. 
if you were baptized in the Jordan River, you were dying to self and being raised to new life for them in the Messiah that was going to become. For us, we don't, thank goodness, don't have to go to Israel to have that done. But when we're baptized, we're baptized to our old selves. We are buried ourselves, and then we are risen to new life in Christ. And I tell people, they say, well, why do you have to do all that? I tell them, it's a lot easier to pull people out of a tub of water or an ocean than it is out of a grave with dirt on top of them. You know, that takes a long time to get them out that way. And they could die in the grave if we were to do it that way. But it's a time of when we're going to start our process of living for Jesus, knowing that Eventually, there's going to be an inheritance for us. Now, they started just like we did. They came out of Egypt. That night that they came out of Egypt, nobody forced them to come out of Egypt. That was no mandate. You've got to go out now. Now, the king said, leave and go out. But each person had to decide if they wanted to leave Egypt or not. That was their decision. And that's the same way with salvation. You have to decide yourself if you will answer the call of the Lord to become one of his children, to accept him as Savior, Lord of your life. That's your personal decision. And nobody's going to force you to do that. You don't have to do that. Then, you know, as they went through these things, uh, a lot of them whined and cried and moaned and groaned and complained the whole 40 years they were out there in the wilderness. They, they claimed, uh, they just whined all the time. But nobody ever left and went back to Egypt. Did you notice that? Even when they started to get a bunch together and say, let's go back, that fell through too. And believe it or not, most of you would never believe it, there are still people that are whining and crying and over everything, nothing's ever right, this is wrong, but they're not turning their back on God. He's just got a whiner and a complainer on his hands until the day that he takes them home and then... Some people say that they might be whining and complaining in heaven. I can't imagine it, but, you know, they've done it on earth all their life. And and there are people, it's like when when you ask them, how are you, you don't want them to answer. (laughs) You know, It's it's one of those things, don't answer. So you just say, hi. (laughs) <laughs> That's all, <laughs> because you don't want to hear the rest of it, you know. <laughs> now, when they got to the promised land and they went over Jordan, they get into Jordan. That's their inheritance. But they still have to conquer it in the here and now, okay? Now, eventually, we don't, we're going to get an inheritance that it's going to be for the eternity when we die. But we're not dead yet. So right now, we're in a time when we can enjoy part of our inheritance right here, okay? So (laughs) with that, I want you to, um, we're going to go to a lot of different verses here. Uh, A lot of these battles that they fought, that we put names to, are not actual battles and as far as warfare goes, when they are attacking another nation with their swords or spears or whatever they had there, uh, a lot of them were just battles within themselves. When you take the battle of pride and position, it was two people, they, they were saying, we should be where Moses and Uh, Aaron are. They wanted to be in that position. Of course, that was great punishment for that because these were the anointed ones of God to do what they were doing. But, you know, 
people are people. And that was a battle that was fought, uh, you want to say, internally. They had to learn, wait a minute, you're where I want you. No, you're not the captain. Doesn't matter. We need lieutenants. We need captains. We need sergeants, believe it or not. We need all these people. Not everybody's going to be the one in charge. But the rest of us are the supporting role of those people. And so that's a battle that was fought within two individuals there. Now, when you get to chapter 13 in Joshua, this is where we begin to start giving out the inheritance in the land there. And I love chapter th the first verse. It is so honest. Now, Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said to him, you are old and stricken in years, and there remains yet very much land to be possessed. I love that because he and Caleb are about the same age, two years maybe there, within five years of each other. And Caleb says, I'm as strong today as I was 40 years ago. I can go out to war. I can come in from war. I can do all this. And the Lord never corrected him. And in fact, he did it. He said, give me that mountain. And he went and drove out giants and all. But here's Joshua and he's, the Lord saying, you're old. <laughs> you're not going to be here that much longer. You got to get this done, okay? And then he goes on to say how they're going to divide the land. And because you or I were not there, we don't have these landmarks. I'm not going to go through all of that with you because you'd be as lost as I would be. Yeah, so, all right, where is that tree and where is that rock? You know, because that's the... the um, uh, boundaries of territories that were there, okay? So when he says this, he looks at the, the size of each tribe, the number of people in it, that how they're going to have this much land, how much land's going to be cut out. Every one of your Bibles, if probably, has maps in the back, and one of them will have the division of the land. I didn't get here in time to get one pulled up. And I don't have that little clicky thing that Pastor Jim has. That was amazing last week. He had the curtains opening and closing. And I'm thinking, where did he get that from? You know? I, I don't know how he does that. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that, he starts divvying out the land. Now, in um, Joshua... Caleb, of course, I told you that, he got the land that he asked for. He said, when I was in there, I was spying out the land. I saw this piece of land, and I wanted it, and that's what I want, Joshua. And Joshua said, fine, have it. It's yours. And then he asked later on, he said, well, I need the field next to it. And his daughter was saying, we need that. And then when she got that, she said, uh, by the way, Daddy, we do need some water on this land, so what about a couple of springs here? So she got the upper and the lower springs. She just kept adding and adding, and we can do the same thing. We can have this mountain, as it were, whatever it is that you want, and then you can say, but I want this to go along with it, too. I want my children saved. I want my grandchildren saved. I want this one healed. I want this to happen. And if you earnestly are desiring it, and it's not out of God's will, we have to keep that in focus always, you can have it. It's yours for the asking. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. He says, we're two or three are together and agree on any one thing, it'll be done. Now, that is a promise, I grant you, and I believe it. But also, it has to be in the will of God because James tells us sometimes we don't get what we ask for because it's not good for us and we would consume it on our own lust. So there are some things you can pray for 
until your dying day and you still aren't going to get it because God says, that's not good for you. That is not good for you. And no, you say that to your kids. How many of you had a 14-year-old that wanted to drive the car? <laughs> yeah, we all laugh at that. Yeah, right. Sure, you're going to drive a car at 14. <laughs> sure. But we've seen on TV a couple of times where five-year-olds, six-year-olds got mad, decided to run away from home, and instead of doing it on feet, uh, they got the car and went driving in the car. And then the police have to go tra tra uh, tracking them down. But you know, we, don't, we say no to them because it's not good for them to do that, especially in this day and age. Now, in, Gen in Joshua 19, in ch verse 47, we have Dan's tribe. Now, Dan, you don't hear a lot about the tribe of Dan, but Dan, he said, uh, this is the inheritance. Well, well, let me start at 47 here. And the coast of the children of Dan went out, what, went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Lezim and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and called Lizham Dan after the name of Dan their father. This is the inheritance of, his, of Dan. Dan said, this isn't enough for me. He didn't bother uh, Moses, uh, Joshua with it. He didn't complain to anybody else. He just said, you know what? Let's just go on out and we'll take this area here and we'll conquer it. We will sit to kill all the people that are there that ought not to be and we'll have larger inheritance. You don't always have to ask permission to do something like that in your own life. You can ask it for yourself. You don't have to go to somebody else and say, well, I want it, and they're gonna pray and it's absolutely gonna happen right then. That does not always happen. You can do for yourself without whining and complaining. If you quit whining and complaining, I know none of you do that, that's understood. But people that do that, if they quit whining and complaining and sit down and start saying, Lord, how can I do this? Should I do this? That should be the first question. Should I do this? And if I do, how can I do this? And then the Lord says, I, you can do this. Or, no, no, that wouldn't be good for you. Okay. So with that, no, Dan, he just goes out and conquers more lands. We extended our borders, and it was in an area where it didn't infringe on anybody else. Then you go on uh, Judah's tribe in Joshua 9, uh, 19, verse 9. You've got to go back a few verses here. Look at what they did. Uh, out of the children of Judah was the inheritance of, of the children of Simeon, for the part of the cho children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of Judah. So Judah's got uh, way too much land. They don't need this much land. And if the land isn't occupied, there will be beast and everything else that's going to come in, not going to be good. So Simeon, being a smaller tribe, put Simeon right in the middle of Judah. And you think, well... Oh. Okay, that could work. And that's sometimes the way it does work. That somebody else has something going good, whatever, and the Lord says, look, this person can help you. They're not as big as you are, but they can work well with you. And so you go and you are help to that person. You're within their boundaries, but you're a big helper to them. Does that make sense? that you can do that. Then, uh, you know, uh, Joshua and Joshua 17, Manasseh and Ephraim, they were a pair. They're brothers. And in chapter 14, 
uh, chapter 17, verse 14, the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, now the children of Joseph, they each got inheritance, Manasseh and Ephraim, okay? They spoke to, um, they said, why have you given me but one lot? And one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord has blessed me hitherto. And I love Joshua's answer. If you be a great people, then get up to the wood country, cut down for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants if Mount Ephraim is too narrow for you. Too little for you? Fine, go out and conquer. Same thing before. It's up to you now to add to what you have at that point. I love that. If you're such great people, then go and do it. You know, he, He's right down to earth where we are and says what sometimes we want to say. But <laughs> there are things that constrain us sometimes to say, don't say that. That's not good to say right now. You're not in a good place to say this. But the question we need for here and now, not in the future, how big are we in God? How much of God do we want in our lives? How much are we willing to fight over whatever it is that would keep us from growing in the Lord, from being larger in the Lord in territory type thing, that we have faith that is above what we had before, that you can believe God, that you know how to pray through and get an answer. You see what I'm saying? That you can believe this. And that's a way that we need to grow and to do and to be in the Lord. Uh, when we came, went to Germany, I can tell you, um, we left my mother in the hospital. She had had surgery for uh, exploratory surgery type thing for cancer in her back, and they was, hadn't even begun the treatments of chemo when um, we had to leave. And my husband told me, he said, look, you can stay here and be with your mama. You know, the doctor had told us, and he was a very good doctor, he was very honest. He said, your mother has between six months and five years, and that's all. She'll be done. If she lives five years, that's going to be just an outstanding thing. But in praying about this, I had peace in my heart. She's going to be all right. You need to go with your husband and your children and go on over and know that she'll be okay here. It was a sad thing to leave her standing at the hospital window waving goodbye, but there was such a peace in my heart that I knew it's gonna be all right. And in a year or two, a couple of years, mama came over to Germany, spent about six, eight weeks with us. When she came to visit, she came to visit like they did in colonial days, Took us a long time to get here. We're staying for a while. <laughs> she was always there, six weeks or better. And, but she came over. We came back home. She lived just short, less than six months, of living 20 years after that time. Because God, and I can tell you why, pastor sat up with her at night after the surgery my sister and I were there during the day, and he was reading his Bible. And in reading his Bible, wherever he, for whatever reason he was doing it, in the book he was in, he read the words, I will come to you on the second day, and on the third day I will raise you up. And that's exactly what was happening. He came to her. He ministered, got her through, and back then, chemo was bad. Back then, she would go get chemo treatments. She'd have enough time to go to the uh, drugstore, get a prescription, get home, and lay on the couch because she would be violently sick for about three days, and all she lived on was soda crackers and ginger ale. 
because it, 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 it was still experimental, I guess you could say, back there. But she made it through it, and he raised her up to where she lived almost 20 years. But I had a piece. I had to have that as my inheritance. You know what I'm saying? When you get that, that's part of your inheritance, is to have peace about something that you don't know how it's going to be. That is not a way, I don't know of a way, that you can live, uh, that you can have never fought the battle of unbelief and then live in self-will. That did not happen. <laughs> you cannot believe God. Like he says, believe me, and then you're going to do your own thing? That isn't happening. There's no way, because you're not going to do, be in believing God if you're over here doing your own thing, saying, that's okay, you can say what you want to say, I'm doing this. I don't trust you to do what you say you can do. Uh, one of um, the things uh, that is a... Uh, a uh, big stumbling block at first is when people come into salvation and they're serving God and in their growth they are taught with somebody preaches on tithing. We had a man come to the Lord <laughs> preaching on tithing in South Dakota, big guy. And the first time he'd ever been in church. And my husband thought, well, I've turned him off for good. <laughs> As it happened, when he went out after having prayed, had a good altar service, he said, I never knew I was living under a curse until tonight. And he used the scriptures, you know, for Malachi. But when most people will say, I can't afford to tithe. I'm just barely making it now. How in the world can I do that? Well, I don't know how it works, but I know it works. I don't know. Um, Angel Gail, um, you know, her husband doesn't come to church with her. He's not a Christian any longer. Um, I don't know what happened. He was at one time. But there's one thing Jerry's never forgot, and that is tithing. And he was in a, and it, it was really weird, he was in a discussion with somebody at work, and they said, well, yeah, their church taught that, but they just couldn't do it. They could not afford to do that. And Jerry's answer was very, very simple. I can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> that was his. And all these years, they've been married over 25 years. He has insisted. And in fact, the other week he said, oh, don't forget to tithe on this, whatever. <laughs> you know. But it's a principle he's learned and he's kept. Do I think Jerry will eventually be saved again and accept the Lord? Yeah. But I'm not going to hound him every day now. He knows where we stand. He knows where angels stand. And he does not stand in the way of her serving God. He does not stand in that way. He lets her do what she knows she should be doing for God. And he's fine with that. Okay? Uh, when we think about Smith Wigglesworth and the inheritance that he had as far as, uh, as believing God, uh, there are many miracles that were performed by his prayer. Uh, Pastor Jim was saying one the other week that uh, there was a tent, tent meeting, and I guess tent meeting, and anyway, they were having prayer, and a man came in in a wheelchair, and Smith Wigglesworth went to him and stood him up and said, Stand. And the guy flopped down <laughs> in the wheelchair. And he picked him up the second time. I stand up. <laughs> and the guy fell down again in the wheelchair. After about three times, there was a guy across the way who said, Quit torturing that man. <laughs> Smith Wigglesworth said, Look, you tend to your business, I'll tend to mine. And got the man, stood him up and said, Now stand. And the man was instantly healed. He believed God was going to heal him. He raised a couple of people from the dead. One of them was his wife, Polly. <laughs> she died. Smith went and prayed, and she was, came back to life. 
And when she came back to life, she was saying, Smith, what have you done? And he said, but Polly, I can't live without you. And she had to spend time saying, yes, you can live without me. You will be fine even without me. And let me go on. And then he, he reluctantly, I guess he kissed her goodbye and she died again <laughs> because that was what God's will was, but he wasn't going to go by God's will at that point. He was saying, I can't do this. You know, forget it. I need her, God. <laughs> that was a, they got word in the middle of the night that a man down the street, who was a sinner, and Smith had witnessed to him and tried to get him to accept the Lord and everything. And the man never did, and he died. And as soon as he heard that that man had died, and I believe it was in the middle of the night. He put his, was putting his clothes on to leave. And his wife said, where are you going? He said, I'm going down there to get that man saved. And she said, but he's dead. He said, I don't care. I'm praying. <laughs> he went, prayed for the man. He was raised back to life. And then he got saved. And then, you know, he lived for a while afterward. And you think, well, that's wonderful. How come that doesn't happen with me? Well, probably there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that you probably aren't praying about every 15 minutes. That might be a reason. He uh, was in a coach going somewhere. And uh, all of a sudden, he calls to the man driving the horses. And he says, stop, stop, stop. And they said, what's the matter? And he got out of the coach got down on his knees in the dirt and was praying, God, forgive me for not having prayed for 15 minutes. It's been that over that time and I have not prayed. When you have that type of prayer life, you might be raising the dead too, you know? But it's how much of God do we want now? not in the future, right now, that we can help somebody, you know, that we can do things. And if we were to, you don't know what would happen if your prayer life changed so drastically. You have no idea what could happen. And then, of course, Bible reading. You need to read scripture. It, it, it gives you God's post all along the way of where to go and how to do just like we've gone through these battles. That's about 25 battles. But each one is relevant for today because we all fight different battles all along the way. I used to say all the time, um, must have been about 20 years ago, when I remember there was a guy named T Tiny Tim, I think. He had a ukulele with tiptoe through the tulips. Remember that? Some of us. That was true. <laughs> Poor Allie sitting out there saying, tiptoe through the tulips laying a ukulele. <laughs> yeah, 40 years ago, he was known. <laughs> yeah, he said, we're just going to tiptoe through the tulips. We're not called to tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> we're called to be soldiers. We're called to be fighters for the Lord. And we're in the army of the Lord. People say, oh, the Lord isn't going to be fighting like that. Oh, yeah, he is. He's got a whole army of angels. When they come and get in the mix, it's going to be some battle at that point in time. There was um, a lady, and she I just heard it the other week. This lady was real sick, and her, she was going into surgery. She was a singer, and the surgery that she was going in for was going to affect her vocal cords in such a way that she would never be able to sing again. And so the doctor told her, he said, well, we can either leave it like it is, but that's going to cause you to die in the, you know, fairly soon, or we can do this surgery. And she told him, she said, I'm going to believe God that I'll be able to sing. And so go on and do the surgery. And the mother was praying about this. And she said, Lord, 
send your angels to protect her and to keep them from making any mistake that would keep her from being able to sing. So the morning of the um, surgery, it was a small town, so her minister showed up and another minister that she knew showed up. To, they were pray, were gonna pray for, and then two other ministers showed up. And she didn't know them, so she figured they're new. All four of them prayed. Then they sat and they waited, they waited, they waited. After the surgery, the surgeon comes out and says, um, surgery was a great success and we'll see you know, what happens. Well, the two that they didn't know about, they went looking for, the two that she knew, they went looking for these two unknown ministers and went all over the hospital trying to find them. They never found them because they'd been two angels sent to be right there during that surgery to keep her. Do I think angels can do things like that? Oh, yeah. Angels can show up, and a lot of times we don't even know that they've been there. They didn't figure it out, but, oh, when she came into the room and was waking up, she came into the room singing Amazing Grace. Yes. How much of God do you want that you can believe God for that? You see what I'm saying? There's a lot that we can do reading scripture of what God has done. I still think it is a marvelous thing when the walls of Jericho fell down. I would love to have seen those angels at that point in time pushing those things straight down in the ground. And they found them. But I, I think that would have been a most glorious day for them because it said every man went straight up in front of him. And they had, they had walls taller than the ceiling. <laughs> but when you believe God, when, you, when you're giving more of you to God, then God gives more of him to you. That, you know what I'm saying? That's the way it's going to go here. We can conquer anything. We can do anything if we will trust God. If we will do what God says for us to do. That's where, and it, it, it isn't any problem with the word. It isn't any problem with God. The problem is us. A lot of times it's us. We're not obedient to what we ought to be doing. But we're going to try, try to keep growing closer in him now, for our inheritance now. Now, there's another inheritance. And this is the one that you get when you die. Okay, <laughs> and you're going to get this inheritance because you are a child of God. When um, parents die, generally speaking, if they use their head, they will have a will. If you don't have a will, I can tell you now you are in trouble because the state's going to take most of what you got. You need a will. And... A, a will is going to say who gets what. We had three children, so our will was they share and they share alike. Each one shares, share alike. And we also had the stipulation in there that if one of them passed before we did, then their third goes to their children. And they split it equally. So with us, we've still got Pastor Jim, we've still got Angel Gail, but we don't have Melinda Gay anymore. But I have Ariel and I have Davis. Those two, if the Lord tarries and the rapture doesn't take place before we die, then those two will take Melinda's third. We have an inheritance in Christ because we're the family. We're the children. We're going to be there, okay? In Romans, the eighth chapter, we can finally get to the New Testament here. It's always good to. Romans 8, 
There it is. Verse 16 says, um, wait a minute, 8, 6, oh, I like it. Yeah, that isn't what I'm looking for. I'm looking, the one says, we are joint heirs with Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ. Oh, I was in chapter 7. No wonder it didn't make sense. Okay. Here it says, verse 8, 16, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We are heirs alongside of Christ. We're going to inherit. Whatever Christ inherited, we inherit. Heaven. Pastor Jim said at uh, the morning service in the song, are we saying, that it was written because it's out of scripture. And that, and he had sung right before that, a uh, mansion over the hilltop that Aris Danhill wrote. He said, God, we're not going to be interested so much in our mansion. What we're going to be interested in is being around the throne of God and worshiping God. They, the angels constantly, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Can you imagine what that will be like when you get to join in and say, holy, 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 and the elders are throwing down their crowns at his feet? Can you imagine all that? that if your mind can, can go there in your wildest imagination to think of what heaven is going to be like. Paul said, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God had prepared for his children. If we can have a good life here, it's not always perfect. I understand that because we're in a sinful world. We're in a world that's cursed. But to get to where there is no sin, only praise. They say um, that some uh, times uh, people that are not sinners or not Christian will say, well, I still want to make it to heaven. I want to be there. In actuality, they would be the most miserable person in this world if they were in heaven because they're not part of the saved crowd. They, aren't, they don't like worshiping God down here in church. My land, what are they going to be like with all the angels up there and the saints that are up there, all these people? You wouldn't want to be any place where they were all sinners and you're in the middle of it. You feel out of place. You don't want to be there, right? It's like, how come I got in the middle of this anyway? But it'd be the same thing with people that are not Christians. And I don't care if you get to be a Christian on your deathbed. My grandfather was saved, one of them, on his deathbed. He was a good man, but he wasn't a Christian. But my mother said, he kept saying, tell them, tell them about Jesus, tell them. And it was, he was seeing songs of people. It was just a day or two before he died. And all he kept saying was, tell them, tell them. You see, we're going to inherit so much when we get there. Um, we go on in Revelation 21. You get to that part, and it says that he that overcometh shall inherit all things. What could be all things? I have no idea. What is all things? Heaven seems like pretty good to me, just to get into heaven. He, we sang that song of Over in the Glory Land, and he told about uh, Jim Dixon, 
who never sang just over in the glory land. He sang way over in the glory land because he wanted to be in the middle of heaven. He didn't want to have to just slide in and be at the, right there inside the gate. He wanted to get way over. Freeman would remember him. <laughs> but think of what you're going to get when you get there. I, I can't even imagine what that's going to be. When you think about the um, the things of our children coming in and being Christians, all of us want that. Do all of us have that? No, we don't all have that. But do we keep praying for it? Yes, we do keep praying for it. Because... If you keep praying for it and praying for it and praying for it, I like the, the parable of the man that just kept knocking on the door and knocking on the door at night until the guy finally got up and gave him bread. You Sometimes we have to be so persistent in prayer, it's not that God doesn't hear us. But God wants us to know, too, how much do you want this? How much do you want what you're praying for? Because if you don't want it a lot, it's not going to mean a lot. My kids, well, they were, I don't know, Melinda was only about three or four, three, maybe even younger than that. The older two wanted light bright. I had heard light bright for two or three Christmases, and I thought, well... Maybe we can do light bright. I don't know. I knew it had a lot of pieces to it. And they often got sucked up in the vacuum, but we'd give it a whirl here. So when we got light bright that Christmas, you know, those kids sat down, opened it up, looked at it, took it apart, and left it. They never made one picture with the thing. Now, one picture, and I thought to myself, you all have wanted this for years, and now you're not even making one picture with it? I was so disgusted that day. <laughs> I can't believe that, you know. But really and truly, it didn't mean much. We had a guy in South Dakota, poor as a church mouse, so help me. <sighs> He used to ride to church in the back of a pickup because he was with his in-laws and they didn't have room for him in the front seat. It was just a, two, a regular truck. What, we didn't have two doors and four doors and all that stuff in trucks. You got two doors and one seat. One of his parents died. I can't remember which one. He inherited a million dollars. Now, this is back in, so we retired in eighty late 70s, a million dollars. Do you know within one year, he was as poor as a church mouse again? Because he spent it all foolishly. Somebody told me that his wife never washed clothes. They were all piled up in one room and she went and bought new clothes for the kids, her, everything. They just wasted it away. When the second parent died, he inherited even more. And that time, there was a financier that, kept, that took care of that money so that it would be left and that it would be spent wisely. It didn't mean a thing to him, a million dollars. You, you can't believe it. When we get to the end, we're going to overcome. One of our inheritance is overcoming death. Christ overcame death hell and the grave, because his life was sinless. I appreciated last week uh, Christ working for his growing up years, stone carver. And his life had to be perfect through all of that. If anything bad happened, the hammer broke, the stone broke where it shouldn't have or whatever, he had to handle it like it was perfect. No saying words that ought not to be said. No feeling things that ought to be filled. None of that. But his life is perfect. And so he has overcome death. Death is not dying. 
I know it doesn't seem right. Death is separation from this life to another life. And if you're not a Christian, then death means you're separated from God for all eternity. That's death. You do not cease to exist. If you're a child of God, death is like, <laughs> I'm so glad I got here. Should have been here sooner, you know, because you're going into a, a better place. I've heard so many people talk about seeing heaven before they got there or see, hearing music. Audrey Boyce, she's a pitiful child. She was sick her whole life. But boy, was she a prayer warrior. And her mother was with her the day she died, and she was in the hospital. And uh, Miss Boyce said, Audrey kept saying, don't you hear that beautiful music, Mama? It's, uh, it's beautiful. And her mama said, Audrey, there's no radios on. There's nothing going on. She said, oh, yes, it is, Mama. It's beautiful. You should hear it. Well, she was. She was here in heaven. Her mother had said, please let her be conscious when she dies. She was conscious, telling her how beautiful heaven was. How many people have you heard that said it's so beautiful, it's light. There's so much, it's blinding light. My brother-in-law saw that. I was glad he did because he was the one that always kept saying, if I don't make heaven, it's going to be your fault. Then that would have been my sister's fault. Now, I know God isn't going to listen to that excuse, but that was his excuse. But to know that they were in a dark room and Glenn saying, there's such a light in here. It is so bright. That is overcoming. And when you get to that part, you have inherited eternal life with God. That makes sense? That's an inheritance. You will be with God forever. Now, we know that it says also we're going to rule and reign on earth. I don't understand all of how God's going to do all that stuff. I just know he says that it is. There's going to be wars. There's going to be battles, Armageddon, um, Gog and Magog, all of that. There's going to be a renovation of this earth with fire. I don't know how all of that's going to come about, but I don't have to do it. So as long as I don't have to do it, I'm just going to see what it is and enjoy every minute of it. You know, because there's some things... We just all go, no. And we talk about, well, why did God do this and so? When we get to heaven, I don't think we really are going to ask God anything. Now, we might want to have a conversation with Moses or even with Adam. What made you eat that thing? You, know, you might want to do something like that. But to, to ask God to say, tell me why you did this. I don't think one of us is going to do that. I don't think anybody's going to do it. Because when you get there, you'll, be, you'll have perfect knowledge to know why God did what he did. You don't have to know down here, but up there you could, you could know. But it also says he'll wipe away all tears. There'll be no more sighing, no more weeping, no more sickness. But the former things were passed away. That's our inheritance. And all we have to do is keep praying, keep living for the Lord, fight the battles. If you get beat one time, <coughs> regroup. Go at it a different way because you can fight battles and win them. The army doesn't give up when they lose one battle. They go back and say, well, maybe we should have done this. You can win all these battles, and your inheritance will be wonderful when we get there. Make sense? Yeah. Makes you want to just fight all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> well.